So we talked about what has happened in our culture, how we have moved uh, to a view of sex that is this boundless view of sex. So our culture is now uh, firmly in, uh, in that corner. If you remember my four views, we are firmly in the corner of boundless sexuality. So what is then the alternative? I tried to show some of the destructive aspects of the sexual revolution of being in the boundless corner. What is the alternative? So the theme for this presentation is sex in God's sight, the biblical vision, the biblical vision. Uh, for sex. I often, uh, I often quote Groucho Marx who said, I think sex is here to stay. And I do really agree. Uh, sex is not a, uh, a trend. It's a basic aspect of life in this world. And therefore we need to think through uh, our view on sex. A theologian, theologian, George Vigel, he has said, for the Christian, the first moral question shifts from what am I forbidden to do to how do I live a life of sexual love that conforms to my dignity as a human person? I think this is, is really important, really uh, insightful. The first question we are asking is not where exactly uh, is the boundary? Where is the line for what is forbidden? Now we need to ask the positive question. How do I live a life of sexual love that uh, conforms to what God has made me to in his image, that conforms to what I am as a human person? And then later on, of course, uh, it's valid to ask about what am I forbidden to do? I'm not saying we should ignore that. Uh, there is a, an issue to be discussed where exactly are the, uh, the boundaries, but that is not the starting point. And I think too many churches focus in on that, what's the boundaries, instead of taking the starting point as what conforms to my dignity as a human person. To uh, quote Frank Sheed again, a typical modern man, when he gives his mind to, it, uh, mind to it at all, thinks of sex as something we are lucky enough to have. And he sees all its problems rolled into the one problem of how to get the most pleasure out of it. To that he gives himself with immoderate enthusiasm and very moderate success. Success, in fact, can never never be more than moderate because his procedures is folly. Sex is a power of the whole man, one power among many. And man is not an isolated unit, but bound to his fellows in society. And his life on earth is not a whole of life, but only a beginning. To use the power of sex successfully, we must use it in balance with the rest of our powers for the service of the whole personal personality within a social order with eternity to come. And all this is too complex a matter to be left to instinct or chance, to desire or mood or the heat of the blood or the line of the uh, la least resistance. It calls for hard thinking. Okay, so let's try to do some thinking about a Christian view on sex. A lot of people would share the fear that Nietzsche had. He, said, he has said at one place, I would only believe in a God who knows how to dance. And the point is, he would only believe in a God who affirms life and joy, who is not a God who diminishes and destroys. Now, unfortunately, uh, Nietzsche has totally misunderstood uh, the Christian faith because the Christian faith talks about a God who knows to dance, who is the source of all beauty and joy, who is the source of love. 
and sex and pleasure and delight, who is the source of love and commitment and relationships and compassion. He is the God who knows to dance. He's the source of music and rhythm. So we shouldn't be afraid of exploring what's God's thought. He's the source of everything that we at our deepest really long for and need. And when you open the Bible, you, you can find this. There is a, a whole book. They are celebrating romance and sex and the erotic and the, the love between a man and a woman. The Song of Songs. Uh, which is a celebration of this dimension of life. It's filled, the book is filled with the sensual, with colors and smells and sights and touching. The Bible is not afraid of that. It should be put into the right place, the right context under God in accordance with his will. But there is a, a lovely affirmation of this aspect. In Proverbs, the uh, author of this, uh, of this wisdom passage is just amazed over this creation. And he says, there are three things that are too amazing for me. That's too wonderful. Four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a young woman. Now, actually, the English translator here, they are too prudish because this Hebrew author, this Old Testament text, is not just generally talking about the romantic approach of a man to a young woman. In Hebrew, it's actually the way of a man in a young woman. So he is thinking about sex and the wonder and the fantastic thing that God has created of male and females, of bodies, of sex, and of, of being united also sexually to your spouse. So we believe in a God who knows how to dance. And that's why we can explore this subject without fear. And of course, the, the natural place to, to start is Genesis the creation account, how everything begins, how God, through his word, has made everything. And if we study Genesis 1 and 2, and if, if we have had time, we could go through the full chapters. It's very rewarding to do a Bible study of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 with their, uh, uh, with their uh, different perspectives. Uh, uh, not contradictory at all, but they are adding different uh, uh, layers of understanding to who we are as human beings. If we study those two chapters and we ask the question, why are we sexual beings? What have God thought here? We can see that procreation is one aspect and we should take that seriously. We have a mandate from God to be his co-creators. And we have the enormous, fantastic, uh, responsibility and possibility of, of causing new human beings into existence and then to show them love and help them to grow and help them into an understanding of what this kind of life is. So procreation is one aspect. It's not the only aspect though. Sex is also a sign of unity, of a visible sign and seal of the belonging together of a man and a woman. And, and, and we can see how God brings together the man and the woman in Genesis 2 in order for them to be one, uh, to be one flesh, to be united also in their bodies as a sign of their belonging together as persons. And God has chosen to 
give us procreation and to give us that sign of unity and add to it joy and pleasure and passion and excitement and delight. He has created our bodies. So the sexual act when done in the right way uh, is connected to joy and pleasure. And that's God's idea. So the Christian faith has a broad perspective on sexuality. It's not one dimension. So it's not like the church, those wrong church fathers saying it's only procreation, nothing else. It's not like the sexual revolution says, oh, it's my personal selfish joy and ple pleasure. That is the only. No, it's a much broader perspective saying yes to procreation, saying yes to it as a sign of the covenant between a man and a woman and saying wholeheartedly yes to the joy and the pleasure and the excitement. When people come to Jesus with questions uh, about div uh, divorce and remarriage, so it's questions about related to sexuality, it's interesting to see how Jesus answered those questions. In Matthew 19, we can read his response. And he is not actually answering immediately their question, but he asks them to, before giving the concrete answer, to do some thinking about God's intention with this area. So he says, have you not read that he, God, who created them from the, the beginning, and then he quotes Genesis 1, may the male and female, and said, and then he quotes Genesis 2, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Whatever God has joined together, let no man separate. So Jesus affirms Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in his understanding. So for the Christian, this is the natural starting point, uh, Genesis 1 and 2. And what we can see there is that if we go back to, uh, uh, to Genesis 2, where God creates man and then uh, creates uh, the woman and brings them together, then God himself gives an explanation for this fascinating fact that, they're no, that, they, that there now are two human beings, but in two different versions, a man and a woman. And marriage is one of the key aspects here. And you can say that in Genesis 2.24, we are given a kind of definition for marriage. And that is the context for where we are called to express our sexuality. And the definition God gives to the first man and the first woman is that his idea is a monogamous relationship. It is a man and his wife that should be united, not polygamy. It is a heterosexual relationship that God has in mind. It is a man to be joined with his wife. I know, of course, how provocative that is today. And we are, uh, we are coming back to that uh, issue. I will discuss that in, in more depth in the next presentation. Marriage is a, is a change of the social status of the individuals. The man is to leave his father and mother and to hold on to his wife. And that is a social thing that involves other people. You are to leave your uh, father and mother. That is a public social thing that you form a new unit that people then relate to in a new way. Ideally, it's a lifelong uh, fidelity. You should hold fa fast to your spouse. And it, is, and it is in this relationship, the monogamous heterosexual uh, relation that is socially recognized where you hold fast to each other it is in that relationship you are called to sexual union to become one flesh in the biblical understanding in the christian understanding marriage 
is a covenant. It's not a contract. You know, you can, you can sign a contract with a firm and then you can renegotiate uh, the terms and stipulations of that contract and you have a slightly better contract. No, the marriage is a covenant. That's some, something much, much deeper that you are committed to that person. And this covenant is created by public promises and it is confirmed uh, by the sexual union. I know a, a lot of Christians who thinks that you become married by having sex, but that is not the biblical view that just by having sex with someone, then you are married with, with that person. Um, it, it's not. A marriage is established by uh, entering into a public, public covenant with another person. And that covenant where you have say, said, I will belong to you for the rest of my life, that covenant is then confirmed in the sexual union where you give yourself to each other uh, in, uh, in the sexual union. Now, of course, this view of sex is highly controversial. And if you were a group of Swedish students, and I would say, this is the biblical view that God has created as male and female, he has given us sexuality, and then he, he has painted this area where, where you should express your sexuality, and that is marriage. It is only within marriage that uh, you should express or live out your sexuality only within the heterosexual marriage. People would be very confused to say, what is this? Why? But I think the, the, um, the questions here is because people don't think enough about sex. The biblical view of sex, I think, take seriously what we actually all know about sex. Namely, that sex is a unique bodily act. And we know that in, in our uh, legislation. Because in the law of our nations, we make a difference between physical assault and rape as if it's two different categories, to do something with another person's body and do something sexually. So deep down, everyone knows that sex is a different kind of, of act. And if you use that wrong, it can scar people for a very long time. It's a unique bodily act. That's the reason why the Christian faith says it belongs to a unique context. And secondly, it has a unique function in a real love relationship. This everyone knows. When people, even in, in very secular Sweden, falls deeply in love or form a, 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 a relationship, get married, then suddenly the sexual act takes on a function of being a sign. And suddenly the whole relationship is threatened if one, uh, if one of the spouses is having a, a sexual relationship outside marriage, then everything is undermined because sex is the sign of their unique belonging. And almost everyone who lives in a marriage knows that sex is a unique sign just between the two of us of our belonging together. Now that's why the Christian faith says sex should stay within that. It should always be a sign. Our culture is so, um, uh, there, there's so many contradictions here that people for a long time of their life say, well, sex is not a big thing. It has no sign function whatsoever. I can use it the way I want. And then suddenly sex takes on a totally different meaning and becomes a serious sign 
of a covenant. And the Christian faith just says, you should be coherent. Use sex as you know it should be used when you are in a, a marriage relationship. Use sex the same way your whole life. Or see uh, sex in the same way your whole life. I like to uh, quote from um, the film Vanilla Sky uh, with uh, Tom Cruise and, and Cameron Diaz. And um, the person that Tom Cruise plays, he's, he has a relationship with, uh, with um, uh, the person that Cameron Diaz plays. But then he also enters into another sexual relationship. And when Cameron Diaz uh, understands that, she becomes, of course, deeply disappointed. And she says, uh, her name in the, in the film is Julie. And she says, don't you know that when you sleep with someone, your body makes a promise whether you do or not? And I think that's a profound statement. Your body makes a promise whether you do or not. And deep down, I would say we know that as human beings. We know that sex is not like any other bodily act. We know it's something different. Uh, so there's a reason why the Christian faith puts it in a specific context, the context of a covenantal marriage. Okay, I see my time has, uh, has gone. So I stop here and we open up for questions and comments and uh, objection and whatever you you want to uh, throw at me <clears throat> okay our first question is once someone is a born-again christian and has decided to leave their old ways of boundless sex married or single do you believe that god would allow for a fruitful marriage given that person's past whether it be their second or first marriage hmm. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, to to uh, just to immediately answer your question, yes, I do believe that regardless of our history, God can give us a a, a fruitful, blessed, a beautiful marriage. God gives us a new start. So we shouldn't be devastated by our own broken history, or uh, uh, a, uh, <clears throat> another person's broken history in itself that is not an uh, if, if the Christian faith is true that is not uh, the final things to be sad about that person uh, so you can have a fruitful marriage even if you have a broken past at the same time of course we need to be be honest that when you become a Christian and God cleanses you of, uh, of your sins and of your, your history, your past, there can still be scars left, of course, uh, psychologically and, and, and in, in other ways. There can be memories, there can be uh, uh, feelings. And we have no promise that by becoming a Christian, uh, uh, our whole history will be erased or that there are no consequences in any way of how we lived previously. Sometimes God uh, dramatically do things and restore people so they more visibly can leave everything. Uh, other, uh, other times, uh, people have to struggle more with their own past and, and it's a more a gradual thing and, it, and it's more over time. Uh, so uh, one need to be realistic ab uh, about that, that there can be struggle involved. Uh, but we should hold on to the hope that uh, through, uh, through the cross, uh, we are not bound by our own history. That is the, that is the wonder of the gospel, uh, that our own history is not defining us, us forever. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, how can single people who are Christians live out their sexuality in a way that is biblical 
but also fulfills them as sexual beings and should or should their sexuality be denied? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. The, the question uh, gives us two options. Either we, we are single and we express or live out our sexuality or we suppress our sexuality. Uh, I'm not sure that's the only two uh, options. Notice here that everyone, regardless of, uh, of if we are married or single, have to live periods of our lives where we are called to be celibate, to not live out our sexuality. Of course, for, for, uh, for, uh, for everyone, you have a period when you are young, where your, your sexuality has come alive, but you're not still married. In marriages, of course, there are periods where you don't, cannot live sexually maybe the way you want because of pregnancies and sickness, uh, disease or relationship uh, struggles or, um, uh, or travels or other things that affects. So you're married, but you can at the moment not express or live out your sexuality. And of course, in, at the, the uh, end of, of, of life, a lot of people who have been married loses their spouse and are then single. So this is not uh, only an issue for a, a person who, uh, who uh, define themselves as a single. This is, this is an issue that every human being has to relate to what, how to deal with one's own sexuality uh, in times where I'm not married or when I cannot come together sexually with the person I'm married to. And the, uh, the Christian answer here is, I should not suppress in, in uh, uh, meaning to ignore that I, I am sexual and I feel this way and I have this longing. Of, of course, I should be honest about who I am. There's no way, uh, there's no uh, benefit in denying anything. And I don't think suppressing is, is uh, maybe the right thing, but I think we should affirm who we are, be honest about what we feel, but then we have to make a decision. Should what I now feel be expressed or should I put that aside on more of a waiting hold? until I come into a position where it's right to express it. So I'm not suppressing it. I'm fully aware of, I am sexually, I would really like to have sex maybe, but this is not the right situation. Uh, it's not the right person. Uh, it's not the right context. And then I need to keep it on, on hold. Uh, so it's more of a, a, um, uh, a, a waiting position uh, of course, if I'm, <clears throat> if I'm not married and there's no immediate uh, prospect of me being married in, in, in a short time, it becomes slightly more than a, 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 a on hold uh, position. Uh, but it's still not, I would say, to suppress it. Uh, because if, if you suppress things, it, it tends to hit back in, in, a, in, in a powerful way. So it's, uh, it's still to be, uh, to open, acknowledge who one is and what's going on inside. But then you need to make a decision how to handle this that is going on inside. Thank you. Uh, this will be our last question for this session. Um, it says, do the same rules for sex within marriage apply to masturbation? Hmm. Yeah, thank you. So masturbation, what to think about that? Well, uh, the first thing to say is that the Bible does not address it. And that's actually uh, quite important. The Bible is very clear about a lot of sexual things, but there is 
no place in the Bible that even addresses the, the, uh, the issue of masturbation. So it's obviously that it does not seem to be such a big thing in God's eyes that it sometimes have been made uh, in church history. So I think there is something to be learned from the fact that the Bible is very clear and outspoken and, and underlines a number of things. And this issue is not even mentioned. So that's the first thing I uh, would like to say. And that, that means that some of the self-condemnation that a lot of people feel in this, in this area, um, uh, some of the heat of that I think should, uh, should go. Uh, but uh, there are there are more things to say. The second thing I want to say is that if I then start to think about what is the meaning of sex, well, then the meaning of sex is not my individual or selfish pleasure, but the meaning of sex is communion with another person and also procreation. And those two aspects of the meaning of sex is not present when we masturbate. And I think a, a lot of people feel that too, kind of emptiness that the promise of sex is not delivered in the masturbation situation because the whole meaning of sex is to be related to another person and masturbation is the most lonely thing you can engage in. So uh, I think there is, an, uh, <clears throat> there, there is a case to be made for, for us to think about, is this in accordance with God's intention with sex? I remember I read a, um, a non-Christian psychologist who, was <clears throat> who said, uh, when I give an advice, uh, and he spoke sp specifically to men here, uh, he said, when I'm giving advice to men, how they can boost their own self-esteem, one of the things I say, say is stop masturbating for the coming two weeks. Because it, was bo it will boost your self-esteem when you feel that you have some kind of control over things that's going on in your own body. And I thought that was, that was interesting. And in my, in, in my view, when I've talked to, uh, to men about this, a lot of men masturbate, but a lot of them also say, I would really happy, I would really be happy not to, but they kind of succumb to, uh, to this, not because they ultimately want it, but for other reasons. So, uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that's two, two different um, aspects related to masturbation. The third one is that uh, related to masturbation is often unclean fantasies, of course, where, uh, uh, where you create your, your um, uh, inner images, where, which involves other human beings that you are not married to. Uh, so then that adds another moral dilemma to, uh, uh, to uh, this. <clears throat> 